Hello everyone, welcome to yet another edition of the Rebound series. My name is Farai Mwakutu and I'm your host today, where we are focusing on the tourism sector, one of the industries on which Zimbabwe is pinning its hopes of economic recovery. But it's been affected and hampered perhaps more than any other industry by the COVID-19 pandemic. Today we'll be discussing just, you know, the effect of the pandemic on the sector locally, but also importantly, the measures and strategies that are in place to try and get us out of these challenges and get that sector back on its feet. Joining us to discuss this is none other than Luke Brown. He's the owner of Vayeni. It's a travel and tour and tourism company based here in Zimbabwe. Uh, but Luke is joining us via Zoom from Dubai, so he clearly has the global insights and his finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening in the game globally. Luke, great to have you on the program. Thank you, Fry. Pleasure to be here. Indeed. Now, I suppose to kick off, uh, just to give us a, a, a background to where we are now. Pre-COVID, what was the uh, trajectory or what was the state of health of tourism? Where were we at and what has happened since then? Again, 2019 was probably one of the best years uh, we've had as a tourism industry in Africa. Um, so we were, we were clearly on a trajectory uh, to, to great things. It, it felt like it was exponential. Um, in fact, we were, we were more worried about finding beds than we were about uh, not. So um, it, was kind of, it was quite a nice problem to have. Unfortunately, you know, um, COVID came along and, and changed all that. And uh, now we find ourselves in a, in a much more um, difficult situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what is the status? I mean, we obviously know that for a long time, uh, operations in, in, in Victoria Falls, all over, in most, most resorts, were shut down. Um, job losses, economic impact, revenue losses. What are we talking? What sort of you know, you know, magnitude are we talking about here? So I, I spend a lot of my time in, in Victoria Falls and I uh, was there basically from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, prior to that, I'd been in Europe, but... On my return, I was greeted by a ghost town, basically. And, uh, and that was in March 2020. And it was pretty strange um, to be living in, in, a, in a buzzing, no, normal, normally buzzing tourism town uh, with helicopters flying overhead and you know, people jumping off the gorge, doing bungee jumps and gorge swings um, to this kind of airy uh, quietness about it. Um, and eventually you kind of get used to it and then you sort of start to enjoy um, the natural surrounds because there's not so much noise around you. But, you know, at the end of the day, it certainly doesn't help your pockets and it hasn't helped anybody's pockets. I think, you know, we went through periods, months at the beginning where I think hotels were lucky to have more than 10% occupancy. And, um, you know, we've had, there has been some support, uh, fortunately, from uh, the domestic tourism market. Uh, and, you know, and I think that's been the case across the world. Um, domestic market has propped up tourism in, in various tourism resorts, and that's been no different in Victoria Falls. And uh, we've been fortunate to have that and to be well supported. Of course, every, every, all the hotels, accommodation, et cetera, have had, adjust their rates um, and, and, you know, apply uh, significant discounts from what they were enjoying. Um, to make sure that they, they accommodate properly for the, for the domestic market. And I think that's, in a way, it's been a good thing because, you know, domestic tourism is, uh, you know, they've complained in the past that sometimes uh, tourism in our own countries is, is too expensive. And so that's been good. But, you know, you can't rely entirely on the domestic market because they also only travel during the uh, festive period. And that ties in, obviously, with our public holidays. So it's it's... You know, you get a bit of a rebound over Christmas, Easter, and so on. Um, but then it, it goes straight back down to below 10% occupancies again. And very, very tricky to plan ahead, to plan budgets. Unfortunately, a lot of people have lost their jobs um, uh, or have been put on either short time or, um, you know, a fraction of the amount of money they were being, being paid before. And it's, it's impacted livelihoods desperately. Everything from the taxi driver to the manager of a hotel, to a guide on a safari vehicle. Um, you know, everyone's been affected. And, you know, I was just watching the news last night and, and, and incidentally on BBC, they were saying it's been around $4 trillion lost worldwide now to the tourism industry. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's been absolutely devastating. And uh, we've had a roller coaster ride since because every time you feel as if 
you know, things are getting better. For example, in Victoria Falls, um, government made a very uh, popular decision to vaccinate everybody in the town. We, you know, we, we, we received uh, herd immunity within a short space of time. And uh, that was great. But at the same time, um, if people are, are not allowed to travel from overseas because they have to be quarantined on their return or they simply aren't allowed or they, they're getting advice not to travel, doesn't matter if we're safe on the ground, we're still not going to receive the tourists. So, mm. you know, in some respects, it's been, we, we, we've had uh, a little bit of international traffic coming through. We've been fortunate as a business that we've been supported. You know, we typically deal with a high end client who supports us. And, um, you know, they, they tend to travel in a bit of a bubble already. And, uh, you know, it's really that sort of mass market tourism, middle level, low budgets, unfortunately, they've been more affected um, by, this, by this. Indeed. Um, we'll come back and touch on some of those issues that you've raised, but uh, you, you did talk about support coming in from the domestic market. I want to talk about the support that has come from, from the government. Uh, we, didn't know, we do know that uh, certainly some funds were uh, availed or put, given to, to, to the tourism sector. Uh, how far did that go? It's tricky for the tourism sector to, to fully comprehend um, the, the scale of that support. Um, government um, certainly made announcements that uh, monies and funds were being made available uh, for you know, rescue packages and so on. However, I think it's been difficult for many businesses to actually receive those fundings because when they go to the bank um, and, and try to apply the bank's are telling a different story that um, mm. actually we cannot receive those funds. And so, um, you know, to be honest, uh, most of the businesses have just had to find a way to fend for, them, fend for themselves. I, I'm, you know, obviously talking about a Zimbabwean perspective. Government mm -hmm. has helped wherever possible. And I mentioned, you know, vaccinations. I think this was a very good step forward. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Zimbabwe Tourism Authority has been doing their bit and trying their, their best uh, from, from a domestic uh uh, launching their, their campaign Zimbo, um, mm. which certainly has, you know, put tourism on the map locally, um, you know, but there's always more that can be done. And uh, as far as the rescue packages have gone, I, I'm not sure. I don't personally know of, of anyone that has be, been able to avail of that, um, but mm. I may well be mistaken. Certainly mm. we haven't been able to. So perhaps what, what, what would also work, or perhaps if, if those funds are not available, perhaps there could be relief in other ways, perhaps uh, lower uh, taxes or lower uh, license fees, th those sort of uh, other you know, concessions here or there that could allow you to stay afloat. Or you know, have they insisted that you know, Zimra wants its amount, these taxes are required, everything is still as it was pre-COVID in terms of expenses? With, with, with the way things are, I think, you know, everything's open to communication. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're able to sit down with the, with the authorities and explain your situation there and, 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 and get a supporting ear, um, then it's possible that you can, you can get some reprieve. Um, in terms of official notices, however, uh, I know that, uh, you know, um, there, haven't, there hasn't been reprieve in terms of um, taxes and, and rates and so on. You know, I'm speaking as a, as a relatively small business, so I'm not so affected. But when I speak to colleagues in the industry, particularly hotels, um, I, I do know that they, they are affected by ongoing taxes and in some cases even increases in, uh, um, in, in rates. Um, however, having said that, I also know that um, government has made efforts to reach out and uh, discuss, um, you know, uh, these issues about, you know, whether the taxes can be raised or not. And, and it's, it's the onus is upon industry as well to, to engage government. So I, I, you know, I don't want to really um, mm. go into the fact, in, into whether it's uh, right or wrong, but uh, I think communication is key and um, very, very important. And I think if we, all, we, you know, we're all in the same boat here. We're all coming from, the, from, a, from a very low base. I mean, tourism, there's nothing. I mean, it's there for everybody to see. It's not like tourism players are sitting with a lot of money to be able to pay uh, the normal amount of taxes or to be, have rates, uh, rate increases thrust upon them. 
And so I think it's incumbent on authorities to understand that, to recognize that, and um, for both both players to to come to sort of uh, cool their heads, come together and, and work out a plan. And so I, I have seen rate increases, but I've also seen um, announcements to to the effect of, hey, let's sit down and talk about it. So I think there's, you know, um, hopefully, hopefully agreements can be reached. Let's put it that way. Indeed. We need to take a short break now. Luke will come back and continue this discussion. It is the Rebound series with me, Farang Wakutuya, speaking to Luke Brown, who is the owner of Vaini. Uh, it's a tourism company operating here in Zimbabwe, and we're focusing on this sector, particularly how it can come out of the woods post-COVID-19. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. Welcome back. The conversation continues here on the Rebound series. Luke, before we went to the break, you obviously were talking about the impact and effect of COVID-19. Let me ask you a very hard, very direct question. Um, do you see tourism bouncing back from this? I'm an optimist, uh, you know, and I probably wouldn't have started a business if I wasn't. So I will tell you that I definitely see us rebounding from this. Uh, it's just a question of when. Uh, I think, you know, all of us uh, a year ago or a year and a half ago, March, when, when things sort of really kicked off, I think we would have thought that by, I mean, my cautious, optimistic outlook at the time was that by first quarter of 2021, we would be on a path to really strong recovery. Here we sit and we are nowhere near where I thought we would be. So, you know, again, maybe don't take my optimism um, too far, uh, but I still believe, I still firmly believe we are on a trajectory to beating this pandemic. And I, I, you know, I think there's pent up uh, pressure. I think there's a need from people across the globe. They desperately want to travel. I mean, you look at this incredible uh, picture behind me, um, you know, people want to see that people want to get out there and it's the same at tourism um, locations around the world. People want to get out and travel. Uh, I have that personal travel bug myself and, and you know, I, when as soon as there's an opportunity to travel properly and we can all be safe, people will travel and people are traveling even through this pandemic, people have been mm -hmm. traveling. That travel bug you talk about, I mean, I, I remember watching some of these international TV stations and particularly now because it's summer in Europe and places like that, you know, droves and droves of people wanting to, going, to go to the traditional sunshine sort of places, Portugal, uh, Spain, those sort of places. Now, Clearly, there is that travel bug. Are you concerned, though, that those people might not be able to come to Africa because uh, perhaps we're not vaccinating fast enough or we continue to have these waves? Of course, I'm concerned. I mean, especially it seems as soon as we start to feel as if we're coming out of something, a new variant seems to appear. And of course, now everybody's talking about this Delta variant. And, you know, unfortunately, Africa seems to be um, put on a an amber or red list very quickly, uh, certainly in the Western world. And um, that it really concerns me. I, quite often I wonder why, considering when our, our cases are nowhere near what they are in, in the US and the UK, mainland Europe and so on, where a lot of our, our you know, that's our core source markets. So yes, it does concern me. Um, I'm ha have a, having said that, however, and I put on my optimistic hat again, I, you know, Europe is opening up at the moment. It seems to have opened up to each other uh, completely. And I think, you know, maybe they're testing the waters. Um, and certainly, um, I think we're going to see as soon as we do get a few more vaccines in our arms here in Southern Africa, um, that, that tourists will come. I, I also believe that, you know, I'm seeing personally, I'm seeing people from the US, people from the UK are booking with us for the, for the rest of this year. Of course, uh, that's nowhere near the numbers 
um, that could be. But they are, you know, they do want to travel. They do recognize that there are restrictions in place, but we are telling them that it is possible that they can still come and that once they're on the ground, they'll be taken care of. I mean, at the end of the day, a traveler who comes to Africa on a safari is going into an area that is of very, very low risk. They're going into a camp or a lodge where social distance, distancing is not an issue. They're out in the middle of a wilderness area where um, really the chances of, of, of ventilation issues are virtually zero. Um, and so I think the concern is more uh, around the air travel part of it, going through airports, and then the return back to their home country whereby they may need to uh, quarantine or go into some form of, of restricted uh, movement um, when they get back. But again, as I say, I think it's a matter of time before we overcome all of that. The IATA travel pass is coming out. At the moment, it's being tested. I was actually uh, using it myself. I was asked to test it. And um, you know, I think that's gonna make travel easy. I think COVID testing, uh, is going to go beyond uh, PCR testing. I think that's going to make things easier. And um, I think I think our governments, no matter whether they're in Africa, in Europe, China, wherever they are, getting more and more used to dealing with this crisis and getting better and better at it, more efficient at it. And so I'm confident that um, going forward, we're going to be able to tackle this. Um, it's just the the waiting game and being able to survive until such time as we we, we reach that critical turning point again. You're over there now, and I just want to talk a bit about, uh, you just mentioned air travel, which I think is the riskiest bit of travel uh, to COVID-19 because of obviously the high traffic in airports, the restricted uh, environment on airplanes and things like that. Uh, has air travel become cheaper or, or become more premium because of the COVID-19 pandemic? Your own observations of this. Well, I've seen I've seen both happening. So there's been certain carriers that have flown right throughout this pandemic. For for example, Ethiopian Airways has mm -hmm. somehow found a way to fly to all it pretty much all its destinations. And as a result, um, because other carriers have not been able to fly, Ethiopian has managed to lower their rates because they they're actually getting booked up so quickly. I mean. The flight between Addis Ababa and uh, Dubai was absolutely jam-packed full on a 787 Dreamliner, um, you know, uh, and so, you know, that, that flight was pretty cheap. However, when I start looking at other airlines and I've looked at booking with other airlines, I've seen that the prices are two, three, sometimes four times the, uh, uh, the normal amount. And that's because they're unable to fill their, their seats. And in some cases, obviously, some airlines have, have had to shut down or, uh, for example, Emirates, one of the world's uh, you know, best airlines, um, has cut its staff by 30 percent now. Um, but still, they're maintaining another, you know, they're still maintaining a lot of staff uh, and they have to pay for that somehow. And so if they're maintaining certain routes, they have to charge for it. So I understand why they're doing it. Um, but yes, so it's it's it's. It's a bit of a, a lottery. You have to go online, check very carefully where you can get the best rates. Indeed. Talking about top airlines, one has just announced that it will be flying to Harare, uh, well, to Zimbabwe later this year. And that is Qatar Airways. What does that mean for, for us as a, a travel destination and in terms of the global uh, perspective and sphere of things? Very exciting. I think it's great that we've got another Gulf carrier, particularly uh, one such as Qatar Airways. Um, you know, Qatar Emirates really... Um, you know, Etihad, they, they, they're leading the world as far as uh, airlines go. And, you know, to have those top class carriers come in is a great thing. I think it shows a lot of confidence in uh, Harare and Zimbabwe as a destination. I think what we need now is to ensure that our local carriers, domestic carriers in Zimbabwe, you know, are able to um, stand up to the test. You know, we've got fast jet locally. We've got Air Zimbabwe is doing a bit of flying as well. Now, I think they need to make sure that their interline agreements with Qatar, Emirates, so on, are rock solid. And they make sure that our tourists, tourism resorts are well served, not just Victoria Falls. Um, because, uh, you know, Qatar Airways, uh, Emirates, are, these, these are serious players. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you can show them um, that you can uh, have uh, uh, carrying capacity on, your, on those domestic routes, you know, who knows, they might up their frequencies into Zimbabwe. They might not have to stop in other countries on their way to Zimbabwe. 
So I think I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm happy about it. But I think there's a lot more that we can do. And I think there's a lot more carriers that could come into Zimbabwe if we get it right. And uh, we make sure that we charge correctly on our landing fees and so on as well. Okay. Uh, you raise a very important point uh, when you just mentioned there, uh, not just Victoria Falls. Obviously, you are, you've been based in Victoria Falls for quite some time. But do you believe that uh, the sentiment from some people that uh, we're too, as an industry, you are too over-reliant on, on, on Victoria Falls and that is the only attraction? You know, obviously, Victoria Falls sells itself. It's, it's, you know, it's not going to be superseded. Um, necessarily by other attractions in the region because it's Victoria Falls. I mean, it's a place everybody mm -hmm. wants to go to. But at the same time, I think we need to complement it. Victoria Falls by itself at the moment is still sitting under three, three bed nights. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy as a destination. And, and the reason for that is people are coming in and then, and then heading out again out of Southern Africa or going, let's say, to South Africa to a place like Cape Town. And uh, we're not selling... Uh, other products within our country or within the region enough. They're not getting enough airtime. People don't know about them. We might think on the ground that, hey, Wanga National Park, Manapuz, um, Kariba, you know, these are great destinations and we know them. But that doesn't mean that people overseas know about them. I think, you know, um, so on the one hand, our destinations more. I mean, I look at for example, Rwanda, at the moment here in Dubai, there's a massive campaign going on for Rwanda. And um, these guys are, are serious. Eh? They, they, they're really uh, keen to, to send people to that country. Yet it's a, smaller, it's a much smaller country than we are. Um, obviously, the perception of it. Sorry, carry on, Farai. I don't want to. No, no, no. Certainly, no. I, I'd actually was going to ask about one and say, look, and I'm glad you've mentioned it now because, you know, as a country, how do we compete against the likes of Rwanda, who've really been aggressive, as you say? We see them on Arsenal shirts, and that's a whole global audience. So, I think it, it speaks to the point you're making now. Uh, we need to be more aggressive in terms of marketing, don't we? But can we do it without the the, the financial muscle? I mean, of course, that is, that's the big question. You know, C can you do this without finance? I mean, I, I, I don't know what, uh, I don't pretend to know what, how, how Rwanda is, is financing their campaigns and how they've managed to get, you know, big football clubs, uh, you know, <laughs> to support them and so on. However, I can, I, I, I'm sure that they are also getting support uh, from international financing organizations. And I think uh, Zimbabwe, if we position ourselves correctly and we play our cards right, and I think from what I'm seeing, I mean, we had a, 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 a very uh, positive meeting with ZIDA, Zimbabwe Investment Development um, uh, Agency or Administration. Sorry, I forget what the, the, the A stands for, but we had a agency. Yeah, agency. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I know that um, IFC, uh, Division of World Bank, are involved. And um, so there's funding uh, around. And, you know, if we, if we play our cards right, we could be um, also in a position to, to do that. But... Having said that, even without the funding, even without the financial muscle, as you term it, there's still more that we can be doing. I mean, just have a look at what we're doing right now. Um, you know, daily, we could be on Zoom calls, um, you know, talking about our country. And, you know, it, it's all good, well and good, Luke, standing up there and talking about Vaini and Zimbabwe. But, you know, what we need is our, our tourism authority. Um, and, I'm, you know, I, I, I'm not criticizing them because they're doing a lot at the moment. I'm seeing it. But I think, you know, on the international stage, the focus at the moment is local. But I think we can't wait to come out of the pandemic uh, to let the world know that, you know, Zimbabwe is still here. You know, we don't want to be that blank space on the map at the end of the day when, when people come out. So let's make sure that we're competitive. Let's use technology. Let's create a virtual environment. Let's put up a nice banner like I've put behind me. And uh, let's talk about it. I mean, yesterday I was actually, uh, my wife who's in my business with me, she was actually on a call. She'd been invited by Rwanda to be on a call. And it was a Zoom call. And, um, I'm, you know, there's the countries also shouting about it. And that didn't cost them any money. And they're shouting about themselves to the right people in the market. So they went to all the top agents in the US, to the top agents in Australia, China, India, wherever, and said, hey, guys, you've got to be on this call. We're going to talk about uh, Rwanda. We could be doing the same about Zimbabwe, I think. Indeed. We'll take another short break now, Luke. Come back and continue this discussion. It is the Rebound Series. My name is Farai Mwakutuya. Do stay tuned. We'll be back shortly.
Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. We call this effort uh, the Rebound series. My name is Farai Mwakutuya. Today, speaking to Luke Brown, who's our guest, we're talking about tourism rebound and uh, coming out of the uh, COVID-19 uh, distress and crisis that has affected this sector. Uh, before we enter the break, obviously, Luke, we're talking about the need to be competitive and aggressive. Uh, again, before that, we're talking about, you know, it's just not Victoria Falls. We need to make sure that we sell everything else. Uh, and also, I would imagine, up the standards there because... It has to be world class. I mean, these are discerning travelers who are coming here who want to consume a product that is top notch. I think we've constantly got to be comparing ourselves with other world class destinations. And uh, if we don't do that, we're going to we're going to fall short. And that doesn't just mean infrastructurally, obviously, from a service level as well. And we've got to make sure that we understand what it takes to be, um, you know, a, a, pro a provider of world class service. Um, and as I say, uh, I mean, at the moment I'm in Dubai and, you know, I always like to benchmark us against Dubai because they really have achieved a level of service, which is incredible. They've got infrastructure, which is incredible. Um, you can stay in anything from a, a three to a five to a six or seven star hotel here. But let me tell you one thing, which is a constant with any of those, and that's the service they will go above and beyond to look after you and take care of you. Now, I think in Zimbabwe, we actually have that naturally. I think Zimbabwean people are very natural, at, uh, are very service oriented, but I don't think we can rest on our laurels. I think we need to be constantly making sure that uh, we, we meet the standard uh, on the ground and then infrastructurally as well. Yes, of course, we need to be improving our products all the time, whether that's uh, uh, accommodation or activities, um, making sure that we, um, have facilities that um, are of a very high standard. Um, and look, I have seen in Victoria Falls that uh, over this period, people haven't just sat back and done nothing. I have been quite pleasantly um, surprised and encouraged by the fact that I've seen a lot of hotels continuing to build, continuing to add new wings, continuing to build new properties. And, you know, there's... Uh, um, a bullish outlook. If I ever saw one, you know, people are, are struggling, but they're finding a way to make sure that they're ready for when tourism really comes back. So I think now that's a great thing. And I, 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 I'm just hoping that, you know, the rest of the country um, takes a leaf out of that book and makes sure that they're ready for it as well. Indeed. Key to, 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 I think, growing tourism beyond just Victoria Falls is, is something you mentioned earlier. Again, that's interconnectivity, the ability for a tourist to come into Victoria Falls, see the falls, do whatever they do there, but then be able to quickly go to Kariba, quickly go to Vumba, quickly go to all these other places. A place like South Africa, for instance, all these destinations, Cape Town, Durban, are just a, an hour, a half an hour flight away. Uh, we are restricted in terms of the ability of tourists to get around because airports are, are limited and also the roads uh, perhaps aren't as great. If you were to do a SWOT analysis on, uh, on us as a tourism destination right now, uh, one of our glaring weaknesses would be the ability to move around with, with real ease um, mm -hmm. compared to other destinations in South Africa, like you said. Look, mm -hmm. uh, we're still way better than other destinations, but, you know, again, we have, we must improve. We've got to uh, stop only plying the Harare Victoria Falls routes, you know, uh, by air. And we've got to open up the Victoria Falls, the Chiredzis, the Machine goes the, you know, the, I mean, Bulawayo is in there, of course, but, um, you know, we've, we've got to do that. And I know, I mean, I'm, not, I'm nobody's fool. I understand business. I, it's, it's a catch 22. You've got to be able to guarantee the people um, to be able to put those planes in the sky. But I think, you know, we can be clever about how we do it. Let's put smaller aircraft on those routes. You know, let's, let's, um, let's try and adapt and get around the difficulties and make sure that we're there. Um, certainly we've seen the likes of African bush camps and safari logistics were starting to provide those solutions. 
um, uh, others like uh, Alt Air, Wilderness to an extent, we're also starting to provide those solutions 2018, 2019. Um, and then of course the pandemic hits. So, you know, hopefully we're gonna get back to that. But I think it does take the likes of FastJet, um, Air Zimbabwe, you know, these are, these are your mainstream airlines uh, who are looking to, to uh, grow domestically. I think they're the ones that really need to be looking at this. We shouldn't be looking at an accommodation provider or a tour operator, tour operator necessarily to fulfill that role. We have our own niches that we're filling in the tourism industry and an airline uh, to operate properly, that's their focus only as an airline. They shouldn't be trying to, trying to do all these other things that they, they, their own focuses should be that. And then in, in terms of uh, ground movement, you're right. I mean, I think our roads uh, need work. They're still a lot more possible than many other roads in Africa. But I think, uh, you know, the government has uh, made promises that, that our road networks are going to be sorted out. And I think a lot of work is being done. But, um, you know, we need to move as quickly as possible on, on, on these areas. Um, you know, self-driving in Zimbabwe is very popular, or it was very popular prior to COVID taking off. And uh, I think it will be very popular post-pandemic as well. In fact, there are even a few self-drivers moving around during the pandemic. But, you know, if you've got a deteriorating road network, you know, eventually that word of mouth is going to get back and they're going to say, wow, guys, it's actually not that great, you know. Um, so we need to make sure we can do that. I mean, and of course, uh, uh, I don't need to explain that roads are needed um, for other parts of, of our uh, to drive our economy in other, in other industries and other um, factors as well. Indeed. Now, uh, you are in Dubai now, I'm sure, obviously, scouting for business there for your own uh, entity. But, uh, you know, in terms of markets that we should be looking at, uh, I know there was a big push to try and, uh, you know, look at markets like China, the Far East. We've had our regional markets, uh, Europe, America. Where should we be, do you think, uh, targeting as strategic in terms of where we can get uh, tap into the market once things start to normalize and, and, and attract those tourists? We must ensure that we maintain those markets. But at the same time, you know, if we're wanting to get business, even through this uh, shaky period, we need to look at which countries are. And uh, one country which is traveling like crazy at the moment is Russia. Um, I mean, Dubai here, every second person that I see on the street is, is, is a Russian. Um, and my understanding is that at the moment in Russia, um, if you are holding a Russian passport, you are allowed to travel and come back into Russia without quarantine. I, I, I'm, you know, I might need to be corrected on that point, but as far as I know, other countries have capitalized on this. Dubai being one of them, Maldives being another, and actually a friend of mine in the US was recently in the Caribbean He's actually also a tour operator and he was scouting uh, new hotels in that area. And he said the, the hotels were filled with, filled with Russians. So, you know, I mean, uh, if these other countries are managing to do it, you know, why can't we? And uh, so, yeah, as I say, <laughs> Russia, Eastern Bloc countries, um, they seem to be traveling a lot. I think we need to be looking at that. You know, as long new, uh, when we, we are hampered, we're not looking at ways to get in. We're worried about the, the, the um, language barrier. We don't understand the country well enough. Uh, mm -hmm. We're concerned to travel there because we're not sure how to start. I mean, me being uh, one of them, I keep saying to myself, I must travel to Moscow. I must go and find some business from there. But, uh, you know, it's always a bit like, wow, I don't know. Can I go there? Is it going to be tricky? And so on. So I think we need to get over that and maybe look at, at that as an option. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, very important, uh, the point you raised there, just about, you know, awareness, the culture, just doing that intelligence and understanding uh, who we want to do business with and just learning a bit more about them, not assuming that, you know, the same marketing strategy that we used in, in London or in the USA will work in China or Russia, for instance. Um, and I think, you know, we need to just make sure when the doors open again that, uh, you know, we're going to be able to recover just from, from where we were before. Let's explore the new markets. Let's use this, this quiet time. You know, sadly, I found two types of people through this pandemic. The person that has, has taken this period and said, wow, I'm going to really use this to do the things that I wanted to do before or to explore areas to, to grow in areas that, I, that you know, I wasn't able to do because I was too busy before. And then you've got the other type of person, those that have been sitting back and having a you know, one and a half year holiday 
and just sort of hoping that the money will come back to them when, when times return. I think they're in for a, um, a, a rude awakening. Mm -hmm. Earlier, uh, much earlier, I think in the first segment, we spoke to the issue of, uh, uh, you know, because we are tapping into the domestic market now, there's been a review in terms of rates and, and charges and pricing and things like that. That has been, you know, traditionally for a long time, a very contentious issue when we speak to tourism players in this industry where uh, people say that perhaps our product here is overpriced or it's not value for money. What are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on that are, are twofold. Firstly, um, let me sort of defend uh, a little bit why rates have been quite high. Firstly, um, you know, market forces uh, will determine uh, how, how high a rate goes. So if, if, if for example, in Victoria Falls, I explained in 2019, our problem was being able to try to fill beds. Uh, sorry, not to fill beds. Um, our problem was being able to try and find beds. The beds were full. Yeah, so, I mean, essentially in that situation, um, you know, people can almost charge what they want and uh, people are still going to come. That doesn't mean, however, that they were, that, that everybody was charging ridiculously exorbitant rates because there is a time that comes where even those with money will say, no, well, you know what, this is not a competitive destination. I'm not going to travel there. Um, but there are other determining factors that, that result in a high rate. One of them being, yes, uh, rates, taxes that, that are being charged, but also the fact that in order for hotels to meet certain standards, let's talk about food, for example. From outside of the country, which is, which is costing them a lot of money to bring in. If they're making payments, they're bringing in uh, materials from outside the country because they feel that they aren't being able to source such items locally. Now, I think some of that is changing. I, you know, I, I think um, through this period, we're starting to learn that, hey, we can grow our own things here. Uh, we can source things locally. And, and you know, hopefully that can bring prices down. The fact that Zimbabwe is a US dollar based economy does by virtue of the fact that we US dollar makes us more expensive. And so if you're sitting in South Africa on a rand, or you're sitting in Zambia on a kwacha and you're a tourist and you want to come to Zimbabwe, naturally you're looking at exchange rate and you're saying, wow, you know, that's expensive. Um, so yeah, we, 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 we have this sort of issue whereby pre-COVID, it wasn't really an, uh, too much of a problem for the operators because they were getting this international travelers who are earning US dollars, pounds, etc., that are coming in and saying, well, you know what, it's fairly expensive, but it's still affordable. Then COVID hits and all of a sudden the glaring uh, elephant in the room is, hey, actually we are an expensive destination because we can't attract our local market. And, uh, and what you've seen is obviously is the drop in prices and actually the hotels and lodges, some of them are still managing to survive based on um, you know, lower rates. So I think it's taught everybody a lesson. Um, first things first, never ignore your domestic market. Don't ignore your regional market either because when COVID comes along or something else comes along, um, we need to be able to avoid that problem. Indeed. Time for uh, our final break and then we'll come back and wrap up the discussion. I think perhaps now just uh, re-emphasizing the steps that we need to take uh, going forward. But I'd also like to, you know, just find out the role that technology can play because I think you mentioned that a bit earlier as well. Very interesting uh, given the challenges that we are in at this point in time. Luke Brown is my guest on the Rebound series today. We're going to take a short break and return. Mm -hmm. Do stay with us. Every Zimbabwean wants their country to return to its former glory and we believe that we have a role to play in doing that. So we'll be speaking to different Zimbabweans from different facets of life to share their views of what it will take to get Zimbabwe to rebound. The Rebound series comes to you every Friday between 5 and 6 p.m. on the Heart and Soul digital platforms. Join me, Farai Mwakutuya, for those incisive discussions. This is the Rebound series. We continue this discussion focusing on the tourism sector. Luke Brown is joining us via Zoom. He's in Dubai. 
but he owns a company that operates and is very much on the ground here in Zimbabwe, sharing his insights and experiences. Uh, and certainly very valuable insight coming through. Uh, I did mention, Luke, that uh, earlier in the show you made reference to issues of technology and the role that that can play in terms of uh, marketing Zimbabwe, uh, particularly now where we are in a pandemic that has brought to the forefront issues of ICT and its value. How do we leverage ICT? Uh, for I think you know, we need, need to be using uh, IT now for, you know, uh, Zoom, the Zoom calls, etc. all here to stay. I'm not saying that everything's going to be virtual. I'm just saying that virtual is now a big part of our life, much bigger than it was before. And unless we embrace it, unless we find ways to understand it, we're going to go backwards. So I think the other big thing is augmented reality is becoming a huge thing. Um, and I think by uh, 2025, uh, it's going to be part and parcel of everyday life, um, like we're seeing with Zoom now, if not sooner than that. Um, you know, we're, we're, for example, I'm here in Dubai uh, at the moment, uh, due to come back to Zim shortly. But what, I, what I'm seeing is that they are using augmented reality already um, to uh, showcase um, examples of activities that uh, in the tourism industry, um, when they're talking with their clients. So, you know, you, you, you may go into their office and they might plonk some goggles on your head if you want them. And uh, you can experience um, something that they're trying to sell to you. So you might be wanting to go out on a camel ride in the desert or um, to get in a, in a vehicle and do some dune bashing or something, but you want to have prior knowledge of that. Mm -hmm. And so this augmented reality is a way to, to give you a bit more of an understanding of what lies ahead. And I think, you know, for example, I mean, let's say that we can put people into a safari, virtual type safari uh, situation whereby they get to understand what it's going to be like. It will never replace the actual thing. But in some ways, it enhances our ability to sell and market this to them. And uh, they feel more confident in what they're going to see. And I think hotels can show people around their hotels using this uh, quite well, as opposed to just a traditional sort of uh, promotional video, you know, they mm -hmm. could have a sort of augmented reality version of it. And I think we need to be using that technology for that is still quite expensive at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, for example, you I mean you can just go on a, on a Zoom call and with your laptop, you can just walk people around your facility and that mm -hmm. gives them a sort of uh, virtual experience. And I think um, whereas before, we would hesitate to get onto a Skype call and talk with our clients. Now, um, if you're not talking to your clients four or five times before they visit Africa for their safari, then maybe you shouldn't be in business or maybe <laughs> you'll lose your business to your competitor because mm -hmm. be sure enough, they're going to be doing it. So I think, you know, there we go. I mean, it's, it's there to stay. We have to use it. We have to embrace it. And I've only touched on it. Um, yeah. on, 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 on some of the benefits. But uh, yeah, I, I think going forward, it's very, very important. What is the role for, for young people in tourism? Huge for them because, you know, as a young person, um, it, you're automatically uh, streaks ahead of people that are sort of older than you when it comes to technology. So, I mean, these guys are literally, I mean, the phone is a part of their body now. Um, uh, which can be very irritating for older people. Um, but if the youngsters can find a way to still have a personality and also use their skills on their phones um, and their speed at technology, um, you know, I think big tourism organizations that will embrace um, that type of person that I've just described now to have in their in their organization because they know that these people are going to help get them ahead when it comes to advertising, marketing, so on, using the technology, because it's very difficult to keep up with it. But I mean, apart from that, apart from the technology side of things, I mean, young people just generally have uh, more energy, uh, more passion, more optimism for the future. You know, they, they, they want to, they want to grow and build. And so I think, you know, people need to be, um, need to embrace youngsters and teach them, yeah, you know, come come in with with the experience that the older guys have. The youngsters need to be um, they they need to understand that hey, these older guys know something. They know more. They've had more experience. 
but marry the two benefits, you know, the experience mixed in with the, the understanding. So I think young people play a huge role um, for those for those aspects and, and probably a, a lot more things that I haven't mentioned as well. Mm. Now, you did mention, obviously, safaris. I mean, I think that would be the, the unique selling proposition for, for this region of Southern Africa, clearly for Zimbabwe, the big five, the wildlife and, and all those sorts of animals that we have. How important are, are conservation, is conservation an element of this? And is that something that we could also possibly sell to say, look, come through and experience how we are preserving this wildlife, how we are coexisting with this wildlife and, and, and ensuring that uh, it's sustainable going forward? I'm so glad you raised this towards the end of the program as a as a sort of a parting shot, hopefully. I, 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 um, I'm I absolutely passionate conservationist myself. I'm actually a zoologist. Uh, that's what I studied and then got into tourism. And at the beginning of last year, actually, uh, together with my brother and my wife, we set up the Zambezia Conservation Alliance. And you know, I'm not trying to, to, to make a punt for that. But the reason I'm mentioning it is that you know, we've been wanting to, to be more deeply involved in conservation because tourism and conservation go up, uh, tourism in Africa. And I, I think tourism, I hazard to say tourism uh, in many natural places around the world go hand in hand with conservation. If you do not have, if you do not preserve the wilderness around us, um, tourists simply aren't going to come. I mean, forget the benefits that preserving the wilderness does for our health, for the, the health, the natural health of a global population, which I think you know, if we destroy those things, we're gonna we're gonna come second anyway. But from a tourism perspective, you know, tourism brings in the revenue that helps to drive the conservation. Conservation makes sure that we preserve the resource that drives the tourism. So it's it's a figure of eight. It's a nonstop mm -hmm. thing, and the two uh, work hand in hand and cannot do without each other. I think it's absolutely imperative that anybody starting a, a safari business does so with conservation in mind. There's no ways that you can believe that you can uh, do tourism nowadays um, in, in Southern Africa and Africa uh, in a safari context without um, playing a role in, in conservation. And that role, take off your business hat and focus purely on giving back. Make sure that revenues from your business are going back into conservation in some shape or form. Make sure that your conversation comes in with the, the tourist that's coming to your facility or traveling with your business or doing your activity understands how um, you are, that, that service is giving back to conservation. Mm. Um, and if you explain that properly, you probably find that a tourist is going to open their pockets even more to make sure that um, that those areas are conserved. So I think absolutely of critical importance. And I, I just want to mention the illegal wildlife trade now is the third biggest criminal industry in the world after human trafficking and drug smuggling. And mm. um, it's, 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 it's linked to, uh, um, it's linked to terrorism. It's linked to, to drugs. It's linked to all sorts of horrible things. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that we, we stop that. Now, I also just want to make one last point, uh, and this is a controversial one, but <laughs> conservation has been perceived to be uh, something that is like a whites only thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we need the, this, <laughs> conservation is for everybody, um, every single human being to embrace, to be proud of our natural heritage and to ensure that we take care of it. Um, this is not something that's just for a certain group of people. Um, all of us need to look after it because it will benefit us all. I, I think that the point that you make uh, certainly is quite valid. And, and I think speaking, to, having spoken to, to, to people in this space before is, is pro possibly emanates from the fact that the communities on the ground, the grassroots, perhaps don't see the value uh, from this wildlife or from this habitat that they are meant to be preserving. So there's a perception that all the money is going to the safari operator in the community gets nothing. So perhaps that's, that could that be where it's coming from? Um, I think first things first, we need to understand the bigger picture in that if we degradate our environment, it's going to be bad for us all. It might not seem, seem to be bad for us today because at the end of the day, um, you know, a lion, a lion coming in and, and eating my, my, my cow or my goat or whatever is not a good thing. 
I mean, I, I totally appreciate why that would not be beneficial. However, if we understand in the long-term scheme of things, um, the benefit to us, but also it's incumbent on tourism operators to ensure conservation is, and when I mention conservation, I'm not talking just, I'm not talking just about conserving an animal. I'm yeah. talking about conserving an entire environment of which human beings are a part of, mm-hmm. an incredibly important part of, we are the custodians. So community is the custodian of that environment. They need to be involved, not just in receiving funds to make up for the loss of a goat. They need to be involved in the decision-making um, as to how those animals, are, are the wild animals are being utilized, how wild resources are being utilized and how we can take, for example, uh, these days they, they call it nature-based industries um, or, or, or cottage-based industries whereby you, know, you, can, you can harvest honey sustainably, for example, and sell it. Um, uh, and you know, there's medicines which you get from from the from the bush. Which I mean, Zimbabwe is rich in uh, plant-based crops or wild plant-based crops, um, which we could we could be reaping sustainably and selling. The world wants this. The world is mm-hmm. moving away from GMOs, from gen- genetically modified things. They want natural stuff, and you know, we need to think about hey, today, am I going to farm um, genetically modified crop or is it better to farm uh, something else that someone uh, could need across the world, like a a herbal tea or something like that, or a herbal uh, cream? I don't know. Uh, I think these things are going to become more and more popular. Um, So, I mean, we can talk forever about this. I'm very (laughs) passionate about it. Thanks for raising it. Um, But I just think it's something that's all inclusive for everybody and we need to move away from the old sort of understanding of conservation. Fantastic. And indeed, a very good point there and a very good point at which to end our discussion because we're out of time. But Luke, I want to thank you once again for joining us, for making this time and sharing those insights and information. Thank for having me on the on the program. For I really appreciate it and enjoyed it. And I hope the listeners um, have derived some benefit from it. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for everyone who's tuned in and watched us. Uh, thank you for choosing us. It is the Rebound series only on Heart and Soul digital platforms. My name is Farai Mwakuti. I'll be back again to do this same time, same place. Be sure to join us then. And don't forget to like, subscribe and follow us on our various platforms. Bye bye.